Hey guys, this is Editing Camilla here, and I just want to put in a little disclaimer that while Professor Andrew's review of the material is indeed very helpful in covering the final three chapters of the semester, this review may or may not address specific things covered in your class with a different professor, or may put emphasis on different aspects of the same chapter from other professors. To be safe, please do consult your professor personally for any specific question or concern, and once again, please be aware that there may be minor discrepancies between each class's material. Without further ado, let's begin the review. Welcome to the Intro to Psych Review Podcast. The idea for me is to kind of go over the three chapters that you have for your final exam. It's the memory chapter, the learning chapter, and psychological disorders. So I'll start with the memory chapter. And I think the way I'm going to focus this is really for you guys to see what the important concepts are for every chapter and the things you should be familiar with. Because remember, the, this is not going to be a multiple chapter choice. Uh, well, there's a couple of multiple choice, but it's more going to be about comprehension and there's maybe two or three questions per chapter. So because of that, I'm really going to be sticking to the big topics, not a lot on the details. So it's really about your general comprehension of the major topics. So Chapter six, memory. Memory is a, a chapter that's kind of split into, I'd say like three main sections. So the first section being really what the three stage model is and understanding the idea of information flowing from a sensory memory to short term memory to long term memory. And when something is stored in your long term memory, when you retrieve it, it's brought back to your short term memory. Once so there's a short term memory, it can be changed there. And And because it can be changed, you need to also re-save it again. It's kind of like saving on top of saving. So the idea of this system is really about understanding how the flow of information is happening and how essentially each box functions. What's the difference between sensory memory, short-term memory, and long-term memory? And what can impair and what can improve every step? You know, like going from sensory memory to short-term memory, it's about paying attention, you know, whether you rehearse the information, you make deep encoding, etc. So the idea here is I want students to be comfortable with this system and how the movement of information goes from one box to another. The inner workings of the box should be somewhat familiar. So the fact that, you know, sensory memory has echoic and iconic memory, short-term memory has limits, you know, seven plus or minus two items. And the fact that long-term memory has a great capacity, we think it's essentially kind of long term. What's also important in long-term memory is how long-term memory is organized in the sense that it has explicit memory and implicit memory. And it's important to understand that to have access to these types of memory requires different systems. The explicit memory is much more hippocampal based than implicit memory. So someone that has trouble with semantic memory might not have trouble with procedural memory. But if someone has procedural memory problems, they might also not have trouble with semantic memory. It depends where the injury is. So when you know what the injury or the type of amnesia a person has and they're having with trouble with certain types of memory, you can, you know, if they have trouble with semantic memory, they'll definitely have trouble with episodic memory. So I want the students to be able, like, you know, if I give you a situation and I say the person can do this, and can't do that, A, would they be able to do this? B, would they be able to learn to play the violin? Would they be able to remember their fifth birthday? Right, that's kind of the understanding and playing around with this system that I want students to be able to understand and comprehend. There is So the idea of understanding the role of the hippocampus and pterograde and retrograde amnesia is important too because they're essentially based on how the hippocampus functions. So if someone has anterograde amnesia, well, there's certain things they're not going to be able to do. They're not going to be able to learn new semantic and episodic memory, but their procedural memory might be fine. So I've had a couple of questions from students when it comes to retrograde amnesia and anterograde amnesia. The questions kind of pertain to, could someone have both? Yes. 
Someone could have both types of amnesias. In the case of HM, he had slight retrograde amnesia, which is essentially a year or two before his surgery. He kind of forgot that year. And of course, he had an anterograde memory after. So the idea here is that the hippocampus is very important in being able to go get these memories. So if it has an injury to it, you can't take stuff from short term and make it go to long term. But it's also hard to get stuff from long term and bring back to short term to actually remember if you remember the ideas like when you create a memory um, the hippocampus is gonna split it up into different parts and send all those parts to your brain and then when it wants to recreate that memory it's gonna go get all the pieces and recreate it so that you can actually remember so it's never like a video it's never like a you know a snapshot of what happened it's it's you creating and recreating that memory the role of sleep is very important um, in consolidation so stuff from short term to long term memory is very important here i've had questions about if you don't sleep can you still create a memory trace yes you can but it's probably Probably not going to be as deep and it's probably not going to be as stable so that means that that memory trace could fade if it's not properly encoded so there is some consolidation that happens during the day of course but to make it really strong sleep is pretty much almost necessary so that's definitely the concepts of what I want you to understand when it comes to the model of the memory system what can hinder it what can make it better if you can do certain things can you do others so how the system is going to be affected is very important. There's a little section on a bit of neurobiology, <laughs> essentially. So like the LTP of the hippocampus, talking about the aplasia. I don't think it's something you need to go into details, but the idea of understanding that something happens at the level of neurons to create a memory is probably what you need to understand. And that's it. So if I understand how things go from sensory memory to short-term memory to long-term memory, how can I go get information back? And this is the idea of retrieval. So again, for semantic and episodic memory, this is a hippocampus-based thing. And there's kind of two principles that helps us to be able to go get those memories again. The first one is a retrieval cue. It's just a clue. It's just something that helps you. And the other one is the encoding specificity principle. And the idea here is that it's about how you learn something when you create a memory, it's easier to remember if you are either in the same context or if you're in the same state, like emotional state. So state dependent retrieval is about your state. So if you were mad when you learned something, it'll be easier to remember when you're mad. So this is the idea of this is one of the principles people think that that's why when you fight with your partner about something, other fights pop up because you were mad at that moment and now you're mad again. So it's easier to remember the other times you were mad and transfer appropriate processing is about the context. It's about where you were. If you were in your bedroom in front of your computer when you're learning this material, it'll be easier for you to get it out of your head, essentially, to retrieve the information if you're in your bedroom in front of your computer. So that's why they say like sitting in the same spot in class, for example, would be a good play or doing the exam where you actually learn the information helps with memory. So that first section of material really is about this kind of big memory system, a little bit bit of neuro, well, neuroscience, so the role of the hippocampus and how information flows, how to get it to long term and how to get it out of long term. The last section of this chapter really focuses on the memory problem. So errors in memory or, or what they call like the seven memory failures. So you should definitely be able to identify them and be able to kind of spot them in a situation or apply them to a situation. So I could say um, Mary learned to play the piano when she was like from the age 10 to 15. She's now 25. It's been a long time since she's played the piano. No, and she remembers some things, but she forgot a lot of other things about it. So essentially, what type of memory failure could that show? Well, transience here would be one of those types of memory of memory errors because with time passes, you forget things, you know. Would she be able to pick up on it quickly? Probably, but at the beginning, she'll she'll have forgotten a couple of things. So the idea of being able to identify them, be able to understand their roles in certain situations, you know, we've talked talked um, in the Vox video that you watched, we talked about the role of memory and eyewitness testimonies. So how can those memory failures be implicated in these types of situations would definitely be questions that you could, could be faced with.
life. So less about finding the definition of something, but more about what will be the role of this memory failure in this situation, or what's the difference between these types of memory failures. So you should be able to be comfortable with them. So to me, that's the two kind of big chunks of this chapter, the three stage model, how it works and how the flow information goes from one place to another and how you get information back out and how can memory essentially go wrong. That's how I see this chapter and the things that I feel like you should focus on. Next chapter, chapter seven, learning. So this chapter, I think when I look back on the quiz grades is a chapter that caused the most grief for people. And I understand why the concepts are complicated and they're very applicable. Again, they will be for the final two. I've already prepared you with exercises in class. And if, if you remember, but we didn't exercise, there'll definitely be a question like that in the exam. So this chapter, of course, is split up into kind of two big types of learning, classical conditioning and operant conditioning. And then there's, of course, modeling and implicit uh, learning. But let's be honest, you know, classical conditioning and operant conditioning take up like 80% of the chapter. So there's definitely concepts there that I'm going to be able to exploit. So classical conditioning, again, Pavlov, the idea of having a neutral stimulus paired with an unconditioned stimulus. And if you do that many times, eventually the neutral stimulus will become conditioned, eliciting a conditioned response. Bond. This model of those five terms should be ultra clear. There will be a question, a hundred percent, that will have a situation and you have to identify those and you have to know what they are and how to differentiate between them and be able to ident identify them properly. So a couple of tricks. First, remember that the unconditioned stimulus and the unconditioned response is the natural reaction, the normal reaction that you that happens. I hit your knee in the right spot, your foot kicks. So that's the natural response. And what we try to do is we pair something neutral, so something that doesn't elicit the response with the unconditioned stimulus. So eventually it will become conditioned and elicit that same response. So the, the knee jerk is at first unconditioned because it's due to the unconditioned stimulus, but becomes conditioned, which means that essentially there's kind of three really components to identify here because the unconditioned response and the conditioned response are the same response. They're just due to different things. The neutral stimulus becomes a conditioned stimulus. So again, they're the same thing. And then the other component you ident have to identify is the unconditioned stimulus. So neutral stimulus and conditioned stimulus, same thing. Unconditioned response, conditioned response, same thing. And then the unconditioned stimulus. And if you look at the exercises we did in class and the Pavlov situation and all of that, you'll see that essentially like I use exactly the same words to answer this question. And that's what it should be. URCR should essentially be the same thing. NSCS should be the same thing. So you can start in different ways. You can look at what changed. So what was neutral and became conditioned. Or you can start by identifying the natural response or so the US and the UR. And what was tagged them was attached to that specific relationship. So like in the case of Pablo the Bell. So you really need to get familiar with that. There's the exercises that we have on the slide. I'm sure you can find more online, but you need to be able to untangle all of these. And once you're able to untangle all of these, you need to be able to attach or define or observe or create the six principles that go with them. So acquisition, extinction, spontaneous recovery, generalization, discrimination, and second order conditioning. So like we did in class, it's not just about identifying that, but oh, in this situation, what's acquisition? In this situation, how can you, what would a generalization imply or what would a discrimination imply? So you need to be able to come up with these. If you want a quick, <laughs> a quick review, acquisition is really acquiring a new behavior. So it's learning the paradigm. It's pairing the neutral stimulus with the unconditioned stimulus until it becomes conditioned. Once that's done, you've acquired the behavior. If you show the conditioned stimulus a lot alone, 
Now, with the unconditioned stimulus, the response decreases. That's extinction. The behavior is becoming extinct. It's going away. If you give a subject a break and then you show the CS again, the response will come back. That's spontaneous recovery. So you need to be able to not just explain them in the words that I just said, but you need to be able to apply them to a specific situation. So in class, we did the perfume. So it could be uh, you could start the, the perfume could make you want to shop and it could make you want to shop just at that store or it can make you want to shop at any other store. So that would be like generalization versus discrimination. Second order conditioning, well, maybe on the perfume bottle, there's a logo. So now you condition, you associated the, the perfume with the logo and now just seeing the logo makes you want to shop. So I, I can, I mean, I've said it in class and I'll say it again. There will be a situation where you have to do the classical conditioning paradigm and applying these basic principles. There's also at the end of the PowerPoint, a couple of links that you can go watch to kind of review this in other ways. And it talks about the whole Pavlov of classical conditioning. So be comfortable with those, be familiar with them and watch out for the type of learning that I'm talking about. Like in a question, if I ask about classical conditioning, I'm talking about classical conditioning, not operant conditioning. That's one of the mistakes students kind of made sometimes in the past is that like they'll explain classical conditioning, but I asked for an operant conditioning paradigm. So you have to make sure that you read properly the question. The second major learning principle is operant conditioning. And operant conditioning is going to be, I mean, the big difference is that it's all based on the consequences of your behavior, right? So I think a lot of students had a little bit of trouble with terminology. And the last quiz, the idea of reinforcement and punishment and plus or minus. <laughs> So the idea is when you do a behavior, if there's a consequence and that consequence makes you increase your behavior, it, it makes you want to do the behavior again. It's a reinforcement. If it makes you want to stop doing the behavior, it's a punishment. That's the first question you need to ask yourself. Is this increasing the behavior or is this decreasing the behavior? The plus and minus really come into what type of consequence was it? Was it something added or was it something that was taken away? So a lot of students struggle with the question about the, if I have a headache and I take Tylenol and next time I have a headache, I'm going to take Tylenol again. If Tylenol is effective, so it takes my headache away. Next time I have a headache, am I going to take Tylenol again? Yes. So taking Tylenol and it removing my pain increases the likelihood of my behavior. So that's a reinforcement. And what was the consequence of me taking Tylenol? Well, my headache went away. So it took away something. So it's a negative reinforcement. Enforcement. So first question, is the behavior increasing? Is the person doing it again? Or is it stopping or is it decreasing? And that's when, that's the first question that determines if a reinforcement or a punishment. And I think that's super important. And that's where students make a confusion. And then the plus or minus is really about what the consequences. Is it something that was given or is it something that's taken away? So this is important. And there will be, of course, questions on this where you have to identify these. The other big topic in operant conditioning is the schedules of reinforcement. So the schedules of reinforcement here are not about the behavior, but they're about the reinforcement. So if I say that something is on a fixed schedule, that means that it's something that is predetermined and I'll be able to anticipate it. If it's on a variable schedule, I never know when my treat is going to happen. Sometimes it will and sometimes it won't. So that's the difference between fixed and variable. Is it predetermined or is it, you know, random? Predetermined is fixed, random is variable. The other distinction is interval versus ratio. An interval means an amount of time. So not a number of times, that's ratio. An amount of time, I mean, every 30 minutes, every hour. It doesn't matter how many times you do the behavior, it just matters how much time flew by. Versus ratio, which is the number of times you did the behavior. Did you, every 10 times you jump. It, it can take you 10 hours to jump 10 times, or it can take you 
five seconds to jump 10 times, it doesn't matter. It's about the number of behaviors. If you're getting a fixed ratio schedule, that means every X amount of time you do the behavior, you're going to get a reinforcement. So like if you jump five times, you get a reinforcement. If you play video games, every time you collect a hundred coins, you're going to get an extra life. That can vary in time, but it doesn't matter. It's really about the behavior and the consequence of that behavior. So the reinforcement, when is that reinforcement happening? It's not about if you jump 10 times this time and 100 times the other time. It's how many times and when will you be reinforced? When are you going to get your prize? After, you know, uh, seven cups of coffee at Starbucks, you get a free one. I actually don't know if that's true, but that would be a fixed ratio schedule. It could take you a week to get those seven cups of coffee. It could take you a year to get those seven cups of coffee so time is irrelevant here but if you work in a store you work at Gap and you're not on commission so you just do what you have to do you direct people to the right stuff you go get proper sizes and do what you fold clothes etc it doesn't matter how many pairs of jeans were sold in two weeks you get a paycheck every two weeks so that's a fixed interval schedule you could have sold 10,000 jeans you could have sold one pair of jeans it doesn't matter every two weeks you get a paycheck And that's essentially the thing you need to actually, you need to remember. So two questions for the schedules of reinforcement for operant conditioning. Is it stable? So is it fixed or is it random variable? Or is it going to be after that is it about the number of behaviors, how many times a person did something, or is it about how much time has been spent? And I'd say that this, when I look at the quiz where there was a lot of mistakes, understanding, recognizing schedules of reinforcement, definitely where there was a lot of mistakes. So make sure you're comfortable with them. Look at the table with examples, come up with your own. I, I, by the way, I'm always open. You can myo me and see, give me an example and say, would this be this type of schedule of reinforcement or would it be this type? And I can explain it to you. It'll be my pleasure. And if you can come up with your own examples, it'll help you to understand. And again, I'm, I'm really focusing on the major topics that you have to understand for the exam. Are there details you should know too? Of course, yes, but I, I really want to make sure students understand the focus on the general topic. What's interesting to know also about the schedules of reinforcement is the fact that if you want to teach someone to do something, like if I want to train an animal to do a show, well, at the beginning, you use what we call shaping. So every time the animal does something close to what you want them to do, you give them a treat. And then you do continuous reinforcement. So that's the fixed one. You give them a treat every time they jump through the hoop. But you know, you practice and you make the animal jump 30 times a day. Maybe it's not the best thing that they're reinforced all the time. So if you want to continue this behavior without reinforcing them all the time, you need to switch to a variable schedule of reinforcement because they're the ones that are more resistant to extinction. If you're training a dog and every time they sit, you give them a treat and all of a sudden you stop giving them treats the dog's gonna stop sitting because he's gonna be like um my treat isn't coming what's the point but if he never knows when the treat is coming he'll continue to do the behavior so that's kind of like if you want to train an animal or a person to do a specific behavior that would kind of be the sequence of what you want shaping continuous intermittent then the chapter well it talks a little bit about other concepts but the two other types of learning that we see are observational learning and implicit memory So observational learning is simple. I think students don't tend to have so much issues with that. It's monkey see, monkey do. And we have brain structures that are in place to kind of help us learn by observation. So it trains our brain to do things when we look at someone else doing something. And you'll notice that, you know, anytime you want to try to do something new, it's always kind of nice to look at someone else do it first. So our brain is programmed to look at other individuals and learn from how they're actually behaving. So that's what the Bobo doll experiment. I wouldn't necessarily ask you to explain the Bobo doll experiment, but understand the principles of what observational learning actually is. And then the last type of learning is implicit learning. And this is kind of learning that's out of your awareness. If you have trouble understanding implicit learning, go back to chapter six with the idea of implicit memory. They go hand in hand. To do implicit learning, you have to implicitly remember it. To, you know, if you learn something, you need to remember it so you do it again or not do it again, essentially. So the idea here is that sometimes we'll learn things that we don't realize that we're actually learning. So 
like the examples that are there are um, the, the sequencing, the grammatical strings and the non-grammatical strings. But it's the idea of um, like habituation is one of those examples. It's like when you smell a bad smell, eventually kind of you don't smell it anymore. Well, it's like that too. Like you might not realize that you're learning something, but it's there. It's a process by your brain is actually learning without you really knowing it. And it's hard to explain because you're unaware that it's happening. So it's hard for it to be tangible. But aside from recognizing it, I don't necessarily need you or want you to understand anything more about that. Being able to recognize that, oh, this is implicit learning is kind of fine. It's linked with implicit memory. So it's essentially on the procedural learning and priming phase. So priming and procedural learning are there. It's kind of the idea of learning to tie your shoe. Like it's not like learning math where you learn stuff by heart. You tie your shoe and today's a little tougher and it gets easier, it gets easier, it gets easier through practice. That would be a type of implicit learning. It's not something that you necessarily do actively, it just gets easier because you're practicing. It's part of procedural learning. So again, if you're, you're kind of confused about this topic, go back to the memory section on implicit memory and just think of them as being somewhat the same process. One is about being getting it again in your brain and the other one is about using it later on. So it's both steps. So again, for this chapter, classical conditioning, operant conditioning, definitely the major topics. In classical conditioning, understanding the paradigm. So the NSUS, UR, CS, CS, CR, you know them. And then the six principles uh, that go with them. For operant conditioning, understanding the idea of positive and negative punishment and reinforcement and understanding the schedule. And then just generally getting, recognizing what observational learning is and implicit memory, implicit learning. So the last one, psychological disorders. This chapter has kind of natural parts of it. So the first part is really about kind of the background of psychological disorders, what they are, how we define them. So we talk about the 40s, deviance, distress, dysfunction, and danger. And the idea about these four concepts is that Even though we try to have the best definition for what a psychological disorder is, it's hard to have a perfect one. They're always going to have drawbacks and you should be familiar with those drawbacks. Kind of like the idea of deviance. Deviance is what's different from the norm. Well, you know, what's normal here isn't normal anywhere. And it's not because something is abnormal is necessarily a psychological disorder either. So it's touchy. It's hard to actually define abnormality is what kind of needs to be understood from that. Then we go into the different models. So you should be able to recognize and understand the three kind of main models, the biopsychosocial perspective, the medical model, and the diathesis stress model. So be able to, I could ask a question like from the biopsychosocial model, how would you think general anxiety develops? So if it's biopsychosocial model, there needs to be a biological cause, a psychological cause, and a social cause. So biology, well, what do you know about general anxiety? We think it has a problem with the GABA neurotransmitters. So talk about an imbalance or problem with regulation of GABA. Psychological, well, people with a general anxiety tend to anticipate the worst and tend to think the worst is going to happen all the time. So it'd be like kind of a, a negative or a catastrophe bias, you know, like always kind of think those things. So your way of thinking is a little bit distorted. And then social, well, a social environment could be like lack of social support or, or being in an unsafe environment. You know, if, if you're someone that's scared that something bad's going to happen, but you also live in a war zone, it's kind of realer. So the idea, of, but it's not because you have distorted environment that necessarily you'll develop the disorder. It's the biopsychosocial model, right? So you need to have the three kind of causes together. So that would be an example of how you would actually explain that. And then essentially it really goes into the disorders. So I think the activity that I, I gave in class about the grid to kind of get your thoughts in order is important. I do want students to be able to distinguish between the different types of disorders and within a category which type of disorder it actually is. So within anxiety disorders, there's phobic disorders, there's panic disorder, and there's general anxiety disorder. On the test, if I give you a situation with a person and specific symptoms and you think it's an anxiety disorder, I need you to be more specific than that. I need to say which anxiety disorder is that. It'd be clear on the test. So you need to be able to differentiate them. 
And the thing with anxiety disorders is that however they tend to correlate, for example, like, well, phobic disorder is a little different, but panic disorder and generalized anxiety disorder can like co-occur, but I wouldn't do that on a test, you know, like I'd make it very distinct. So panic disorder is having like these panic attacks and general anxiety is having this kind of always present excessive worry about different things. And phobic disorders, well, it's an extreme fear of either like a, an object, you know, like super scared of spiders or social phobia, which is going to be more linked with being scared of like being publicly humiliated or embarrassed. I won't ask you to go that specific, just saying phobic disorder, that's fine. So for every disorder, you should be able to know the symptoms. You should know a little bit about the background of like why we think they arise, at least the ones that I explained, because we don't know all of them. So why we like, what are the theories behind anxiety disorder, for example? And I then I didn't focus so much on treatment, but just understanding kind of a little bit where they come from. You know, like being able to know that we see them more in men versus women or we think it's their neurological factors, that there's neurotransmitter imbalance, essentially, is what you should know. Understanding that OCD is not an anxiety disorder anymore and why the idea that they redid the DSM and that it doesn't have the same neurological background. That's why it's separate on its own. And of course, being able to recognize it. I think the tough part for recognizing OCD is not confusing it with the personality disorder, which is obsessive compulsive personality disorder. And the difference, the line actually are the obsessions and the compulsions. So someone can be OCD-like, you know, if you know someone who's very inflexible, things need to be done a specific way, things need to be organized in a specific way, but there's no obsessions and compulsions, then that's a personality disorder. So having those ritualistic behaviors is really the thing that kind of draws the line between them. But when you look at someone, when they're not doing the compulsions, they can look very similar. So of course, in a question, I'd make it obvious which one it is, but hopefully it'll be obvious to you too. Then we talk about major depressive disorder and bipolar disorder. Again, same thing, understanding the symptoms, what differentiates MDD to bipolar disorder is important here and why we think they're different essentially. And why do we, like, are there differences in how they actually arise? Because, you know, we do think that there's some common links between them, common genetics, common stressful life events, etc. And then the other disorder that I focused on is schizophrenia. So in schizophrenia, you really need to first be able to recognize it, so know the symptoms, know what's a positive, know what's a negative symptom. And again, the complication when it comes to schizophrenia is being able, again, to distinguish it from the autocentric cluster of personality disorder. So the autocentric cluster is kind of like this progression of schizophrenia-like types of symptoms, you know, going from paranoid to schizoid to schizoid to schizotypal. But the line really is the idea of hallucinations. So when there's hallucinations present, then it's schizophrenia. Schizotypal can and will have delusions, but will not have hallucination. So again, like I've mentioned in the slides, some people do argue that personality disorders, paranoid, schizoid, schizotypal are a progression in schizophrenia, but not everyone who has the personality disorder eventually develops, like I don't want to say full, but full schizophrenia. So definitely uh, being able to distinguish between them. So there are specific symptoms of schizophrenia. What's the difference between a hallucination and a delusion? So be able to recognize those symptoms. You know, if I ask you a question about here's a person, these are how they're acting, their symptoms, diagnose them, tell me why. Well, you have to tell me, well, this happened, this is a hallucination, and this hallucination is linked to schizophrenia. So you need to be able to point out these symptoms to me so that I can actually understand your thought process of why you're diagnosing this person that way. So of course, um, there's a little bit of background on schizophrenia, schizophrenia, how and why we think it develops the risk factors etc the last kind of big cluster and i think is the one that scares a lot of students but you have already a really nice summary table for them is the personality disorders 
So yes, I want you to be able to distinguish them. So I think that's something when you're studying is that what you should do. You should essentially try to find what's going to make it that it's paranoid, but not schizoid and not schizotypal and the other way around. You already have a table that explains all of those clusters and individual disorders. So you can definitely take a look at them and maybe highlight the thing that makes them individual from one another. Well, first identify what cluster they're from and then it'll be easier to identify uh, which one within that specific cluster. I'd say that the harder ones to differentiate are definitely going to be paranoid, schizoid, and schizotypal. Don't worry, I'd make it pretty obvious on the test which one it is. And the other ones are a lot easier to distinguish. So be familiar with the symptoms, be familiar with what a personality disorder actually is and understand a little bit the background of these disorders, why it's hard to understand, uh, why it's hard to treat. So this one is, it's like the mystery a little bit more of all the ones that we've talked about, you know, depression, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia and anxiety disorders. There's been a lot of research on them and we know a lot about the neural functioning of all of them. And we have a good, at least we have several ways to treat them. Some that are more successful than others, and it's not a, an exact science, but you know, we have an idea. Personality disorders is the one that's still somewhat of a mystery for many reasons. And you should know that, you know, the fact that they lack insight, they tend to lie, they, you know, why we use peer nomination. We don't have a lot of data. A lot of people who have personality disorders, the reason we have data for it, for example, antisocial personality disorder, is because they committed a crime or borderline disorder because they attempted suicide. So the data that we have is definitely biased and no one who's forced to participate in a therapy program is going to necessarily be the best subject to get an objective view on the actual disorder. So it's not an easy one to study. It's different from others. We have little data. And if you remember, I mentioned this in the slides, the DSM refined a lot its categories and they changed, you know, mood disorders were depression and bipolar disorder. Now they have their separate categories. OCD isn't anxiety anymore. But personality disorders, they didn't change anything from the previous version of the DSM because of all these issues, because we have very little data about them. So, you know, the DSM tries to stay away from categories, but this one is still within a category. So they tried to change it, but they didn't have enough scientific background for it. So for this chapter, first understand the background of what a disorder actually is, then the models, how we define them. And then it's about knowing each of the disorders, their symptoms, their causes, and be able to differentiate them. So be able to relatively easily, <laughs> in a short amount of time, of course, diagnose someone with obvious symptoms. You know, I'm not expecting you to do uh, 12 hours of therapy with someone to diagnose them. It'll be a little blurb. <laughs> you have to figure it out. So be comfortable with, you know, first identify what category is this. This is, um, I think I'm going in mood disorders here. And then you can kind of identify, oh, is it depression? Is it bipolar disorder? But be familiar with the symptoms and specifically the symptoms that distinguish each disorder from another. Depression is a bipolar disorder. Bipolar disorder has some depression, but also has a manic phase. So if you have a, a patient or a blurb of an individual in front of you and they talk about only depression, then we never talk about the manic phase. Well, then it's most likely depression. But if, if there's mania, then it's not depression, it's bipolar disorder. So you need to be able to kind of see them. And of course, I won't write, the person has a manic phase, but I'll explain, I'd write someone what a manic phase actually looks like. So really be familiar with those. Again, I didn't cover every disorder in the book. That's fine. Focus on the ones that I did. And yeah, have a good understanding of them. And I think I'm done rambling. <laughs>